views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. talk. Legionnaire's disease, a lung infection that can be deadly but is treatable, got its name from a 1976 outbreak at an American Legion convention in Philadelphia. And now, here in 2015, there's been a major outbreak of Legionnaire's disease in the borough of the Bronx, specifically in the South Bronx. The city reports 126 total Legionnaire's cases and says that of those, 94 have been treated and released and unfortunately and tragically 12 have died. The incidence appears to be slowing down, but nagging questions persist. Where exactly did the infection originate? What factors contributed to the outbreak? What's the appropriate response of public officials? And most important, what precautions should be taken to prevent Legionnaires or other health crises from spreading through our borough or anywhere else. So tonight we have two guests here in the studio. We expect two on the phone, each with a distinct point of view. There are lots of questions about Legionnaires and we will try to provide some answers. Now, if you have questions or comments, you can call in at 718-960-7261 or send an email to bronxtalk at bronxnet.org or post them on our Facebook page and we'll read them on the air during a future edition of our program. For the here and now, just back from a Legionnaires Forum at Hostos that was streamed live on BronxNet from the 16th Council District. Uh, welcome back, Councilmember Vanessa Gibson. Thank you. Good Thank evening. you for joining us. Also, the author of a recent Daily News op-ed piece that says this is more about health and environmental conditions in the South Bronx than anything else. Columbia University assistant professor of the sociomedical sciences whose community-oriented South Bronx research includes housing and neighborhoods, financial equity and health, Dr. Diana Hernandez, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. So uh, we'll let you uh, be play news uh, person. Uh, tell us <laughs> what was the news, what happened at the community meeting uh, just prior to tonight's program at Hostos Community College. Right, so tonight's Bronx Forum at Hostos Community College was just another forum that we've had in a series of ongoing efforts to engage community residents to answer questions about the Legionnaires disease outbreak, to really reassure all Bronx residents that our New York City drinking water is absolutely safe to educate them on Legionnaires and also some of the factors that we're looking at and really what we're doing as a city in terms of our proactive and aggressive efforts, our response, and certainly on the legislative side, what we're doing to put in place laws that hopefully can prevent another outbreak of this magnitude from happening. Um, it was very uh, well attended, lots of questions about, you know, the water, the quality of air, some of the debilitating issues that many Bronx residents face and what we are doing about that in terms of our collective work. The most immediate um, legislative uh, issues or, or uh, decisions were that there was going to be mandatory inspections of cooling towers. Yes. Uh, I, I don't want to navigate or play the city <laughs> against the state, but it seems like everybody seems to agree that's what ought to happen. I understand the mayor is going to sign that legislation tomorrow. Why don't you just uh, give our viewers uh, an idea of why sure. that is like the first obvious step that was taken. Sure. Well, intro 866, it passed the council last Thursday. It will be signed into law by the mayor tomorrow. The reason why it's important is, number one, it's groundbreaking. We don't have any other local municipality in this country that has existing mandates on inspecting, cleaning, and maintaining cooling towers. So obviously this outbreak, you know, very devastating, and we pray for the many, many individuals who are affected, the 12 individuals we've lost. We keep their families in prayer. But we realize as a city we have to do something. We have to be aggressive, not only to educate the public, but to also look at ways in which we can 
codify new laws. So this bill, which will become law, will not only create the first ever registry, a database operated by the Department of Buildings of all cooling towers in the city, it will also make sure that on a quarterly basis, we inspect, maintain, and clean every cooling tower that is in this city. If a building owner fails to comply, we have different ranges of fines and penalties, starting with up to $2,000 for the first offense, up to $5,000 for the second offense, and up to $25,000 for the third offense. Obviously, we want to send a message. We want every building owner to be a part of, of this partnership because everyone has a vested interest. This is a public health and a public safety matter. So we wanted to put things in, in place to make sure that everyone cooperated with this. Uh, council member, I realize you're not a scientist. Scientists and they really made a, 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 I think, what was a pretty clear presentation uh, at, at the forum this evening. Uh, folks will be able to see it on uh, BronxNet into the future. They recorded it and you'll be able to see it. So I, I don't want to go get into too much technology on it, and we're going to bring a couple of uh, scientists on as well. Um, but the city's website says New York City's drinking water supply and other water features like fountains, shower heads, and pools are safe yes. and are unaffected by uh, Legionella. Water towers, which are different from the cooling right. towers, Correct. are unaffected by Legionella. Home air conditioner units are unaffected, and walking into air conditioned environments is safe as well. In some ways, it strikes me as a little misleading because under other conditions, those things might not be. A am I understanding this correctly? So I'm, I'm concerned, I guess, that the city is saying, oh, don't worry, don't worry. But maybe there is some concern out there, or am I totally wrong? No, a lot of concern, and that's why we had to do a lot of outreach to make sure that we educated many residents on the, the Legionella um, bacteria growth in cooling towers. Understanding there's a very distinctive difference between a cooling tower and a water tower. Most cooling towers are found on commercial and industrial modernized buildings, not residential buildings. This is an airborne disease um, that if you consume enough of the Legionella growth, if it's growing in a cooling tower, Power, and you have obviously some of the other ailments that you know a weak immune system um, asthma smoking and other things that could lead you to be more vulnerable and susceptible then you could be affected by legionnaires um, so I, that, and, and that's why I, th that's I pointed up in some of those <laughs> other things that if, if, you know if they exist in those other source potential sources it's a little bit that I felt the city was being a little bit misleading. I should add, we did invite uh, some folks from the DOH and uh, from public hospitals, and they declined to come on. So, you know, that's that's where we're at. So that would that would be my concern, and that leads us right into uh, Dr. Hernandez and uh, Professor Hernandez. Thank you for joining us. Um, you uh, wrote uh, that op-ed piece, um, which took a little bit of a different perspective. Uh, the council member has alluded to it. You wrote in the latest outbreak, the main culprits are the underlying health conditions that have made so many bronchites more vulnerable to disease and death than other New Yorkers. So your theory is that there was a reason this unfortunately stopped in the Bronx. Why don't you elaborate on that? Um, so I'll start with saying that I'm a Bronx resident and that I am long-term considering and concerned with uh, the health conditions of the Bronx, both personally and professionally. Uh, I study an area of social and environmental determinants of health, but I also live in an area that is very much inundated with poor health. So there are... In the South Bronx? Not only in the South Bronx, actually at the county level, the Bronx is the unhealthiest... But I mean, the, where you live. Mm -hmm. I but where I live clear. is specifically, yeah. Uh, there, I mean, there are so many things going on uh, in the South Bronx. It's a vortex of poverty, very concentrated mm -hmm. in deep poverty, as well as uh, the kind of health conditions that come with that partly because poverty equals poor health in many ways mm -hmm. uh, and so what what we see is a high prevalence of, of HIV of diabetes of smoking of premature death all of the things that are fundamentally underlying a, a, a disease mm -hmm. outbreak like so, so why is this relevant when we're talking about um, uh, this this sort of uh, airborne disease that seems to come through you know water uh, affected sources. So Legionnaires is not necessarily, it's something that exists in our environment, right? This is a message that is very clear and is obvious, right? It's a bacteria form that exists. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily, in other outbreaks, historical outbreaks, it hasn't necessarily been the case that people die. It could be that they actually have Pontiac fever or that uh, they have Legionnaire's disease, which is a more aggravated and aggressive form uh, that it can take, but it doesn't necessarily equate to deaths. 
So the death ratio can be somewhere between 5 and 10%. Um, it, but in the Bronx, it's on the higher end. So it's at 10%. And there are some people that are still ill and may or may not make it. And so that kind of leads the, when the Department of Health and other, you know, and they're frequently asked questions, uh, that material that they're sending out and their updates, uh, it has been clear that it, people that have underlying conditions are the ones that are most impacted. They, they made that very clear that mm -hmm. of, of, the, um, of the cases that they studied of people Correct. who were affected, Correct. that those people had other underlying factors. Mm -hmm. In a conversation we had prior to the show, I related it to somebody maybe who's out of surgery and their resistance is very low. You would want to make sure that person eats healthy, is, is you know breathing clean air, is drinking clean water and all those things. If mm -hmm. you uh, have other factors and your resistance is low, you, I guess, would be more susceptible, mm -hmm. as, as the council member said, and more vulnerable. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the inequalities that exist um, in the Bronx vis-a-vis -vis other parts of New York City have been obvious, and they've also been historic in nature, right? So this is not necessarily a new thing. It's just that we now have a new window of opportunity to consider it. So Legionnaire basically gives us a new opportunity to look at the health disparities, those underlying conditions, which are social mm -hmm. and health related. You know, I, I was kind kind of thinking that it's like uh, the borough president has the not 62 program yes. and, and yes. we certainly all would support any effort to keep Bronxites uh, healthier mm -hmm. um, that it, it's almost like inevitable I don't want to be like that but it's almost like well the outpost of having these conditions for so long with unhealthy air and, and all these other things and mold on the walls and, and mm -hmm. not only public housing and housing all over mm -hmm. the borough that mm -hmm. we're going to get something like I, I guess that's what your theory is, is about. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, part of what I look at in my everyday life uh, in terms of research are, is the link between housing and health, right? So I look at issues around energy. I look at issues around um, dirty burning fuels. Uh, I look at uh, mold and other mm -hmm. kind of housing mm -hmm. conditions. All of these things are leading to things like right. asthma. Uh, so, so your reaction to the news that they are now going to be requiring uh, cooling towers to be inspected mm -hmm. was measured? Were you very happy about it? You thought I it was mean, a I nice think step? I think it's an important step. I think it's an important step in terms of the registry that allows us to then, you know, basically identify buildings right. that might be, uh, you know, mm -hmm. later on should there be a similar outbreak. I don't know that it's enough necessarily. Um, I, I, I continue to think that there are mechanisms uh, through some, like, Section 8 housing, for example, that has an annual inspection, but then uh, there are many housing uh, risks that, that uh, go you, unattended. That's exactly what I was thinking, and uh, they could see that I started to <laughs> smile when you said that. It'd be nice to have a registry of all the houses that, and all the apartments that have mold on them and all the apartments that have uh, pipes that are uh, not connected to the wall because there's, yeah. there's holes oh, in the wall. That's mm -hmm. the kind of registry that would really take care of uh, problems like this. Let's go to the telephone. Our friend and Mark from Pelham Parkway hasn't called. He's not there? Oh, my Mark's not ready? All right, I will get to that next caller in just a minute. All right. Um, so, um, uh, Council Member, for you, um, what kinds of things, uh, uh, presumably you agree somewhat, at least with what wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly with yes. Dr. Hernandez says, what kinds of things would you like to see happen? Uh, in, um, in in this process. Right, so let me say, like, this legislation is just one important piece, but it's a piece of a long process. We really, as a city, need to double up in our efforts to address the health disparities that we face in the Bronx, and obviously in other parts of the city with poverty, homelessness, hunger. We as a city will continue and have been doing so in terms of investing in infrastructure, in terms of better access to fruits and vegetables, quality supermarkets in our neighborhoods, which people come to me about all the time, green markets, making sure that they cater to families that are on fixed incomes school-based health centers, focusing on community-based health centers and all the organizations that really develop those relationships because many people use emergency rooms as their form of primary care, and that's unacceptable. Do, do you think um, uh, the DOH missed an opportunity to talk about those things tonight? I mean, I didn't hear that front and center. that They, they acknowledged that, that you know people's general health contributes to it, but they didn't say, just as you said, you know what, if people were healthier, they could do better. 
about it. I think they overall acknowledge that we do have a lot of health disparities in the Bronx. Um, I think that's another conversation that we obviously want to have in an aggressive way with the mayor and all of the elected officials, stakeholders, community partners, because this has to be, t to me, a journey. It has to be a mobilization of a concerted effort to make sure that everyone is a part of the conversation. It's not just about money. It's about offering residents better opportunity and access to better products that can lead, lead healthier lives. Lives. Dr. Hernandez, a specific proposal from you other than the general statement that, you know what, we got to do better? So I, uh, I sit on the board of uh, the South Bronx Overall Economic Development Corporation, and in my capacity not only as a board member, um, but also as a researcher, we've been working on smoke-free housing. So yeah. most of their buildings are already smoke-free, and what we've been working on uh, are, are the kind of compliance and enforcement opportunities. But we've also taken it as an opportunity to really think about a building as a site of intervention. So that while people are home, while they're in their buildings, we're actually working on uh, uh, healthy eating campaigns and really considering sugary beverages and uh, considering active living. Uh, thinking about how homes, while they can equate to uh, a poor health, they can also equate to interesting housing opportun uh, um, health opportunities right right where people are, where the, we're encouraging uh, the well, use of stairs, etc. You know, I'm just going to emphasize, I would have liked the Department of Health to say this is what the city's new initiative is, maybe with more energy from a council member and her <laughs> colleagues we can uh, make them do that. I do want to go to the telephone. Um, the executive director of the Gaia Institute is uh, my friend Dr. Paul Mankiewicz and he is with us. Dr. Mankiewicz, thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, Good to hear you. Um, talk to me about what you think happened here and why uh, this uh, spread, I don't want to say like wildfire, but significantly in the borough of the Bronx. Well, the Bronx is still on uh, air conditioning and cooling towers. Hold on, actually, I'm getting an echo, I'm getting an echo on my side. Let me oh, okay. change it. But Turn down your TV on. or whatever you got. But go ahead. Hold on one second. So the Bronx is built on air conditioning and cooling towers. Go ahead. Uh-oh. That must have been some echo because... Uh, where'd he go? Did we lose him, folks? <laughs> He's still there? He's not there. All right, well, we're going to um, uh, try and uh, recapture uh, uh, our thoughts here. Um, let me ask you this. The CDC hasn't been very vocal on this, as I understand it. They need to be, like, invited in either by a state or federal um, uh, a body. Would you prefer to see the CDC in on um, something like this? So I think as a city, we welcome the state intervention as well as the federal intervention, I think they can only continue to help us and complement the work that we're already doing. CDC has signed off and has applauded the response of the city officials and the state uh, Department of Health, uh, Dr. Zuckman and Governor Cuomo and all of our state officials have been very involved because recently I know there have been cases in Rockland County as well as in Western New York. So I think everyone is obviously looking at this with a much clearer eye lens and saying as state and federal what can we do you know obviously the 12 lives that we've lost um, we can't get those lives back but what we can do as a city and a state and a nation is we can react and use those lives that we lost as an opportunity to do better through prevention there was uh, the death of uh, a man named John Rouse a school teacher at PS uh, 325 I don't know if you're familiar with it you're nodding that you're mm -hmm. familiar with it we are. his family says the city never this was in April, and his family says the city never took a close look at what happened. Do you think maybe we've had other Legionnaires' deaths or cases that haven't been uh, addressed or looked at? I absolutely think it's possible um, that we have had other individuals in this city that have lost their lives to Legionnaires. Um, to say, you know, individual cases are, are that, and I certainly encourage family members um, to please come forward if they feel like their loved one died of Legionnaires and they want more answers. But I do believe it's very plausible that we've had other cases, mm -hmm. and I think the city obviously is going to respond. I would just say that our reaction in this particular outbreak 
is an aggressive reaction because we have never had an outbreak of this magnitude. We face about two to 300 cases of Legionnaires every year in the city. We had a case, a couple of cases of Legionnaires earlier this year in Flushing, Queens, and no one knew about it. Mm -hmm. We had whooping so, cough in other places. You know, and, and, and I do want to get this back to um, uh, uh, Dr. Mankiewicz. Right with us. Dr. Hernandez, um, you think it's also plausible that there have been other cases Absolutely. that have gone by without... Yeah, Legionnaires, like I said, is not totally uncommon. It's it's just, it's, the just the, it's the clustering. The it's cluster, the fact that it's yeah. clustered geographically and that in the time frame, right? You literally have July, just uh, July 6th till 10th, today, I think it was. Right, yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. so All right, frame, back right. to Dr. Mankiewicz, who started by telling us that uh, the Bronx is built on air conditioning and then he, we lost it. Uh, are you with us, Dr. Mankiewicz? The problem is a pretty simple one. Okay. And, and that is that we make a, an ecology that doesn't work on rooftops. The reason I built the first green roof in the Bronx is because kids don't have their hands in the dirt, but much worse than that. When you have a thorough rooftop, you can have ecosystems with just bacteria and amoeba. And what that does, even though the Legionella, the bacterium is everywhere, you select those that actually can inhabit our macrophages and kill us, or kill certain of us. And that's right. The disease probably has occurred again and again. And what we need in the city certainly is vigilance because this will occur again and again. Right. But also, ecology on rooftops, ecology really underneath even the air conditioning systems, because that's where this will always select it. That bacterium will become a killer. Okay, so now let me ask you this, on one of the hottest days of the year, it's 95 degrees out there, are you suggesting we could do away with all the air conditioning, or you're saying we could lessen it and make buildings cooler with, by really taking a look at rooftops? That's, that's right. You, we need <laughs> air conditioning to make life possible. But we're certain a building I built in, uh, on a factory in the Bronx, he saves between about 40% of his air conditioning. So it runs much, much less. The 30,000 square foot Parks Department five borough facility uses much, much less air conditioning since we put a green roof in. But the other side of it really is uh, the overall health of, of people, the kind of active life that uh, Diana is describing, uh, makes a huge difference. And having an ecological city as opposed to one that's basically built around these AC units, which will always turn, hmm. uh, is a better way to go. Uh, so what's very interesting, and, and maybe, uh, Dr. Mankiewicz, this would be what your perspective would be, is that this is an opportunity, um, uh, Diana Hernandez said that earlier, this may be an opportunity to take a look at all these things, and rather than, you know, we have a council member here, rather than say, well, we'll put some money to inspecting cooling towers, let's take a lot of money and really uh, uh, spend money on uh, renovating rooftops and taking a look at how we handle those things. I mean, I'm assuming you support that. Well, agree. Uh, Dr. Mankiewicz. Parkland. Or did he made his statement and he's gone. You would support it. Who wouldn't support it? Oh, yes, you there would is. support that. No, but I would. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I dream of a day when we're thinking about how to create really healthy buildings. And healthy buildings, I mean, there's a the syndrome called the sick building syndrome. And that's when, let's say, a school teacher is in, uh, is, is in school uh, teaching all day, leaves that building, and then all of a sudden feels better. But while she's in that building, she's not feeling well. There's also like a building-related illness. But I think that a lot of people are actually suffering from building-related illnesses that go unaddressed because we don't necessarily have the enforcement and the regulation, nor the help necessarily to get the building owners, it's, it's, a, it's onerous, right, I, all I, the interventions that are necessary. I, I would love the council member who's served in the assembly and now <laughs> serves in the city council. Give, give us a dose of reality. If you were to show up at work tomorrow morning, and I hope you're all inspired now, you show up at work tomorrow morning and say, you know what, I heard from Dr. Mankowitz last night on Bronx Talk <laughs> that we really have not only do a good job with green roofs, but a great job. What would it take to really transform the concept so that it's applied uh, th in a large-scale way in the South Bronx? Vision, money, capital, commitment, <laughs> partnership. 
Okay, sure. I vote yes. Do we get to vote? <laughs> vote? Because we have started, you know, with green roofs and, you know, solar energy. Right. I think a lot of it has to be a real partnership for people to buy in. We live Who, in one which of Which people? People as in building owners, ah. landlords. I mean, everyone has to buy into this concept and honestly not look at so much the revenue and the profit side, but look at people. Look at the livelihood and long-term investments that are going to make a difference to keep people living longer and living healthier lifestyles. Uh, is Dr. Mankiewicz still with us? Uh, yeah. oh, what, what would it cost? Give me the cost <laughs> of a, a building or a couple of buildings. Just give me some context to say what it would take to put the kind of thing you're suggesting in place. Well, actually not much in a way. <laughs> uh, for good. one to three story building for large commercial buildings and the like, uh, you can put a green roof on for $20 per square foot or less, and especially if you do a lot of them. That comes back in some case something like five years, maybe seven years in terms of savings on air conditioning and heating. Well, uh, we're, we're, Dr. Mangos, we're going to have to let you go because uh, we're just about out of time. Thank you very much uh, for your time uh, this evening. Uh, Dr. Hernandez, just a, a final couple of seconds from you. Um, these things you see as related to what happened in the Bronx with Legionnaire's disease, and if we address them, we can do better. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think that dealing with the underlying health problems really gives us an opportunity to just live better, increase productivity, both of, you know, the kind of intergenerational productivity of children and adults that care for children and care for older In adults. In addition to addressing In this. addition to addressing yeah. buildings. Uh, council member, do you think this will be a fulcrum to have the, uh, I realize we're not going to solve the problems and, uh, you right. know, do Dr. Mankiewicz's vision in a day, but do you think there's uh, some interest in the council and other um, legislative bodies to really take a look at, at the Bronx in this way? I do, and I do think that it is, uh, you know, unfortunately we've lost lives, but it has given us an opportunity to really try to address something that's probably been underlying for quite some time. Oh, the sure. health disparities of Bronx residents, um, you know, the fact that there's been a lot of inequity when you look at financing and funding and programs and resources. I mean, but we are a borough that is booming, the new renaissance. I call us. We're on the cusp of a lot of development, but we can only do that with a healthy borough and healthy residents. I so I think this is an opportunity for us to really take advantage of, you know, a really devastating situation and find common ground through investment. Okay, Council Member Vanessa Gibson, thank you so much. Thank you. I hope we've inspired you to get back into the City <laughs> Council and fight for these things tomorrow. And Dr. Diana Hernandez, thank you for your input tonight. Thank you. Uh, we're trying to give the people of the Bronx and every wear yes. some vision. All right, they're telling me i got to wrap it up, so I'm not even going to take any more time. <laughs> uh, we'll see you next week. And thank you, uh, Dahlia did a lot of work to put this show together, and Helen, and Bianca, and the cast of thousands. We'll see you next week. sudden signs. Learn fast. Face drooping, arm weakness, speech difficulty. Time to call 911 and get them to a hospital immediately. Learn the body language and spot a stroke fast.